Oh, well, well, let me welcome. <laughs> welcome to the North Reading Historical Meeting. Um, we didn't actually have a meeting, which was good. We go straight into the presentation, which is good now. North Reading Speaks. It used to be called Tales of North Reading, but it's the same thing. <laughs> Old timers talk. <laughs> yes, Mr. Mark. What's that? I'm not an old timer and I'm going to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, be <laughs> all <old> 50. <laughs> but you know Noah is, is, the young, is the token young person. So. All right, whatever. <laughs> all right, but anyway, welcome. I'm handing over to Gordon. Are you too young for this group? Gordon, nothing new to me. Thank you, Jenny. That was dead again. Uh, welcome. Uh, here no, we are. Speak into the Just mic. hold it, hold it between your chin and your chest. Is that better? Yeah. 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 Uh, am I too close? Okay. No, good. good. Well, here we are again. Um, the last time that I had anything to do with this was uh, in uh, 2016, and uh, I don't know how I get into this again, but here we are. And we'll, see, we'll make the best of it. See how it goes. By the way, we have four wonderful speakers tonight. That's going to save. My height, I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, we have uh, uh, Dick Ham is going to tell us. Well, I, I, well, Dick Ham is one of our speakers. Sorry. <laughs> can you hear me? Oh, that's an echo. Okay, yeah, sorry. It is. It's both mics are on, I think. Oh, both. Are on. <laughs> Try that, Jenny. Okay. So, uh, Dick Ham is one of our speakers, and John Watson. Mm -hmm. And Mark Hall and Noah Spicer. So uh, we're going to hear some great stories this evening. And what I thought I would do is uh, just go back to uh, 2016, if you will, where I had mentioned uh, a few of the stories that were told during the bicentennial. As you know, there was a bicentennial a committee called the o Oral History Committee. And uh, the last time we were here, I had mentioned a few of, the, of those interviews, and I'll probably copy, copy, uh, duplicate one or two again this evening. But for instance, uh, uh, the uh, it's uh, I, I always like the story that uh, if I can read my writing. Uh, uh, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I like the story that, that Doris Abbott told about the uh, the train coming to North Reading, yeah. and the, uh, the there were two two trains from Salem, one in the morning and one in the evening. And uh, what I thought was interesting was that uh, the evening train brought in the mail, and if the Democrats were in the White House the mail went to Raya's store. And if the Republicans were in the White House, it went to Carpenter's store, which was in the center of town. <laughs> so I thought that was quite interesting. I had mentioned that before. The, the, uh, the other thing I had mentioned before was the, uh, the, uh, Mr. Raya Sr. had mentioned that there was a, uh, a, a rock crusher uh, at the foot of the, of the, of the common. And he said that the farmers would bring their uh, rocks in from, on, on the, on, in from their farms on wagons and on tip carts, and they would crush those rocks and make make the roads. I thought that was quite interesting. But I was thinking about it afterwards, and I was wondering if at the same time they might have built those stone steps at the bachelor school. Right. The bachelor school was being built at probably about that same time. Yeah. But I, like a lot of you in here, remember those stone steps mm -hmm. as to the place where we used to settle our differences at, at uh, recess. Uh, I know because I went there twice in the fourth grade and once in the sixth grade, and I lost every time. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, I, I don't know uh, if, if when they built those, but uh, they were quite handy for us at that time. Uh, one of the other people that we interviewed, uh, actually wanted to interview, but he wanted to do it differently, was uh, uh, Mr. K uh, Mr. Jones Sr. Uh, 
he wanted to tell about the, the businesses that came into North Reading after he, he arrived in 1910. So he wanted to list all of the businesses that came, and I suppose those that went also. And so he, instead of being interviewed, he decided to put it in writing. And so I have copies here. If anybody ever wants this, he did a marvelous job. Uh, what, the report that uh, Mr. Elmer Jones Sr. had written uh, about the businesses were here in town. Uh, another person that was being interviewed uh, at that time uh, was Mrs. Olive Schneider. And when she was asked if she remembered the name of the first car that the family owned, she said, well, no, but I know you had to crank it to start it, <laughs> and that it had eyes and glass windows, and that on a trip from Beverly to North Reading through, by way of Peabody was a very long ride. <laughs> And also, uh, another person that was interviewed was, uh, I have to look, I thought I could remember. Um, it was, the, it was the, the fire chief's wife. Flossie. What's her name? Flossie. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, Flossie Conrad. Yes. yes, and she said that she grew up on the upper end of Elm Street. Uh, and that would, as you know, that would be uh, the upper end of Elm Street would be started at Dalton's Corner uh, there uh, at Washington Street and Elm. And anyway, it must have been an exclusive area because she said that uh, a Mr. Bartlett would come by in the evening with his horse and buggy and light these street lights. <laughs> so I thought that was quite interesting. And then there was a Mrs. Vivian Eisenhower, and many of you remember her. Oh, yes. When, when I started at the bachelor school, she was the secretary. But I understand later on she became the principal. Yeah. And um, she told about being, going to school in the barge, as they called it. And it was evidently, it was an open vehicle being hus it was hus drawn. <coughs> And Mr. Bartlett would pick them up, and she said it was, she kept emphasizing how cold it was riding to school in that open vehicle. She said you could get 12 to 15 students in it at a time. And she, and she mentioned that she went to Reading High School. And the way she got there was she would pick up the trolley at uh, Kitty's Corner. I'm sorry about that, at Ryan's Corner. And then she would pick up the electric car at Kitty's Corner that was coming down from Andover and go to high school in Reading. Mm -hmm. And after she graduated from there, she went to Salem by train to what was no, they called it at the time, they called it the normal school, but it was, um, it's now uh, Salem State. And then she would uh, come back on the evening train. And she also told about and we know the date now, but she said that she was resting one Saturday afternoon and she heard this roaring overhead and had no idea what it was. And a little bit later, it, the same noise occurred just as, and she had no idea what it was. Uh, it was we now know it was uh, January, it was July the 2nd, 1942, and the B-17 bomber was making its circle, its run, and because it had, I think it had circled twice. And she, uh, then she heard the explosion. And she said that all the men folks started running toward the, where, uh, toward, you know, the, where the explosion came from, and the woods were all on fire and so forth. But they realized that, uh, that someone must have, somehow they must have learned that it was uh, pretty dangerous because the, uh, the shells, uh, were exploding and so forth. So, uh, so I think that that should conclude. The, well, I did want to say this though. I have a uh, a copy of a pretty nice report by the Boston Globe on that whole incident and how the the members of the Veterans Memorial Committee uh, invited part, the, some of the uh, family members. Uh, to a dedication, so it's, you're welcome to copy that if you wish. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our first guest, Dick Ham. You all know Dick, I'm sure. He's done this before. And actually what happened was about three weeks ago, I panicked. I said, what, what am I going to do? How, how, am I gonna, how am I going to get through this? And the first person I called was him. The second person I called was Roy Walters. And, and Dick says, well, I, I'll, I'll think about it and see if, what I can do and so forth. And Roy told me not to worry, that it would all work out all right. So thanks to Dick, <laughs> this is going to work out all right. Would you like to come up here, Dick? Well, hello everybody. Hello, hello. I was just a kid living in Reading. Just a kid. Uh, I spent my first ten years there. Did all the things ten years ten year old kids do. Played with my friends. Took a walk down to Reading Square. When you went to Reading Square, you used to say, "I'm going downtown." Did that. Went to school in one of Reading's half dozen schools. And. Uh, World War II was just tuning up a bit, and uh, my parents had just finished the, oh, they were just getting through the effects of the Great Depression. So things weren't all very, very great. And suddenly, when I was 10 years old, uh, on September 1st, 1940, my mother and father rented a house, a historic house, for $25 a month. It may seem low, but there was nothing but a telephone and electricity. They were on their own for the rest. Uh, I'm happy to say that my brother, my little brother, was here. <laughs> and his wife are living there now and have made a lot of improvements to that house. At, at any rate, it was only a week after we moved in that uh, I had to go to school. Uh, North Reading didn't have six, uh, half dozen schools. It had one, the LD Bachelor School. We never called it the Batch, never. <laughs> never called it the Batch. And uh, the whole town went there. There were nine grades. You finished the nine grades, and after that went back to Reading, to the Reading High School. And one of the first things uh, I remember was uh, the, this bachelor school occasionally sent students over in groups to what was then the library. And uh, I met the librarian. Her name was Frances Foster. She had half of the uh, lower floor of the library up here, if you divided it this way, and people went out onto Park Street with a door that's not used anymore. The other half was used for town offices, and up about the third floor was an auditorium which, uh, where town meetings were held, and where the, the graduation from the bachelor school generally took place. And I remember one of the first adults I met that made an impression on me was the librarian, Ms. Mrs. Foster. Frances Foster was her full name. She seemed right away when we went over, she seemed to like kids. She had a very suggestive uh, sort of a way of uh, recommending a book, never dictating, never getting impatient. And she, uh, she made quite a reputation for handling the schools from the, the, the kids from the bachelor school. I remember her then as one of my first and most uh, steady memories. Uh, the uh, town of North Reading, I discovered rather quickly, did not have a police department and a police uh, station uh, the way Reading did, and it didn't have a fire department, it had a station, but it didn't have a fire department with a chief at all times. The, uh, what the policeman in North Reading was, the policeman, Tom Croswell. 
uh, Tom uh, handled the whole town. I don't remember that he had very much to handle. He was here, there, and everywhere. And I remember my mother uh, once uh, taking a little job typing for him and filing some of his papers, and I was pretty happy. Anyway, uh, but the uh, chief of the fire department, Harold Conran, lived, uh, there are three houses right over there, and the middle house is where he lived with his wife, Flossie, I think Gordon has already mentioned Flossie. Fl and I'll, I'll mention her first because she always made a great impression on me. Her basic job in North Reading, aside from supervising her husband, the fire chief, she had another job, uh, hiring, training, and supervising the telephone operators for North Reading. At the switchboard, which was right over there in that middle house in the front area, uh, there were usually two or three operators sitting there at the switchboard with their, all their little wires plugging in when somebody at a home would ring the, ring the crank and, and ask for the operator. He'd ring the crank and she'd say, number please, and you'd say, I want a 230, please. They had three digits on uh, phones. Three, two, oh, she said, I'll, I'll, uh, I, think he's, uh, I think he's playing golf, but I'll ring him anyway. And uh, she would do it. And I'm sure those telephone operators knew more about the people in the town of North Reading than any of them would want to admit. <laughs> they could listen in at any time that they wanted. And uh, Flossie, her job was to supervise them, and of course at around 11 o'clock or 10, I think, they, the operators left, and there was nobody at the switchboard. But, Emergencies happen and people call after midnight, so Flossie had some sort of a, over her bed, she had some sort of an alarm that if somebody picked up the receiver and called at one o'clock in the morning, she would handle the call, and she would do it. Well, I had an experience along that line once. A friend of mine, well, my, actually a playmate in North Reading, I was a little, uh, little old enough, a little old to, to do this, I should have known better, but he thought, you know, there's a hurricane coming this evening, why don't we drive out to Winthrop and on the seawall and let the waves, let's just enjoy it. He'd just gotten a car at that point, a 36 Ford, I think it was. And uh, I said, all right, I'll go get in my raincoat and put on a, an extra pair of trousers underneath the, outer, uh, underneath the outer ones and we'll do it. And we did. And it was raining and the wind was blowing and we got to Winthrop, to the seawall, and parked the car and went out, pranced across the seawall like a couple of idiots <laughs> and uh, enjoyed being drowned in the, in the, way, in the rain. It was a lot of fun. Unfortunately, uh, my friend, Silman, didn't park the car quite far enough away from the waves. And needless to say, the engine was totally soaked. And just before midnight, when we decided we better go home, you think that car would start? No way. So, we called home. And of course, Flossie was in charge. It was about midnight. My father had very little gas in his car, and my friend Stillman, his father had very little gas in his truck. But Flossie, knowing that certain gas stations around here were closed because the power was out, finally found a station where my father could fill up the tank, and I think it was almost over in Melrose, it wasn't nearby. He went over to Melrose, filled the tank, drove out to Winthrop, picked up Stillman and me, brought us back, and uh, I spent the rest of the evening apologizing profusely for being so stupid. 
But Flossie was the one who got us out of the trouble and found the gas station all right after midnight. She was quite a lady. Uh, everybody, I guess, has heard the expression keeping up with the Joneses. And if you go a couple of houses down that way, I think of two Jones brothers who influenced the town unbelievably. This is before there was a supermarket out on Route 28. And Elmer Jones and his brother Jack opened a grocery store, which is now, I think, a uh, nail salon, and the other half is for rent, I'm sorry to say. They opened a grocery store that had everything, meat, groceries, and the whole thing. And uh, I was told, and I can't verify the truth of this, that they were going to have the signs, Jones Brothers, on the front of the store, they were going to have those signs reflected by a mirror. So they painted Jones Brothers, or Jones, on the store in mirror vision. And a lot of people made a comment, among them my future wife, who thought, what am I getting into? Should I marry a guy who lives in a town like this? They left the, they left the sign, Jones Brothers, uh, in mirror vision for a good many years without the mirrors. And so when you went by, here's a sign, Jones Brothers, you had to stop and look for a minute to figure out what it was. And uh, but they, they uh, they, were keep, they kept up with the town fairly well, and when supermarkets came in, they uh, later on opened a hardware store, Jones's Hardware Store, in the same building, same building, and hired a man from Reading whose name was Chet, and I've forgotten his last name, but Chet was uh, in the hardware store, along with uh, Elman and Jack quite often. And if you go in and say, Chet, I'm looking for one of those doohickeys that cover over the, whatchamacallit, on the, on the, and he would, then you could see his eyes light up. He liked nothing better than to insult you pleasantly, very pleasantly, and, t <laughs> and tell you he couldn't believe that you'd be so unknowing. Uh, and he, I always liked to go in there, even if I didn't need anything, because Chet was such a fun guy to deal with. And uh, in addition to that, over at, uh, over a little to the left, there was for a while Jones Brothers, they had a, a, soda, a soda fountain. And uh, uh, then when supermarkets came in, like the Atlantic supermarket up at the uh, northern end of Route 28, why the uh, store and the the grocery store and the uh, hardware store finally went the way of all stores. But still have the uh, hornet's nest that's been there a record number of years and uh, the center cut. They're still there. Everything in North Reading Center, which that, this is the center, had a, they had a, original names for all the stores. Center Cut. We had a center drugstore once run by Joe Price, a wonderful man. Yes. Center this and center that. Very original. <laughs> Very. Uh, across the street from that, and I won't go into it now, I want to leave some time for the other speakers to do this. Speaking. There is, is, is a uh, Nice grassy plot with a Jones Investment Services. I never see anybody in there, but uh, it's there. But in its place, in that place uh, back in the 1940s, there was a little gas station, the D and S. And the D stood for Doton, William Doton, Bill Doton, who was one of the town fathers and uh, was on the board of selectmen and uh, all, uh, many other boards, I guess and his friend Ralph Sweetland, his nickname was Pecker Sweetland, Ralph Sweetland, and they did, uh, they sold gas, and did oil changes, and some small repairs there. 
Not much is happening there at this time. Uh, I think that that's about all I have to say, and I used up my 10 minutes, I imagine, and I just want to let uh, Gordon take over and introduce the next person on the, on the list. I think you know him. At this time, I'd like to introduce John Watson. John's going to talk to us about the Eisenhower farm. And uh, it's kind of him to do this. Uh, when I called him and I said, John, I don't need you to bail me out. He said, yeah, right, sure. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't tell me 10 minutes, yet. Yeah. <laughs> it won't be, don't worry. <laughs> Um, my, <laughs> my name is John Watson, and uh, I'll leave my glasses on. I'm a lifelong resident of North Ray, uh, but now, being a lifelong resident, I find myself from another era. My father was from Wakefield, and my mother was from Cambridge, and they moved here in 46 while they were waiting for me to be born. They bought a former Boy Scout camp on a dirt road off Marblehead Street, by the Middleton line for 500 bucks. Sounds good, but it had no foundation, no electricity, a hand pump for the well, and it was only two rooms. <laughs> they ran a cord from a house in Middleton for about three years that would only run two lamps and a radio. <laughs> I don't know how my mother did it. She wasn't a pioneer. <laughs> But after a bunch of trips to the State House, Reading Light finally put in some polls in 49. And I actually have a picture of myself wanting to help. I just wanted to go over there and help. I was like three. And we got electricity, and it, it, uh, the polls were from Reading Light, but the electricity still comes from Middleton. And up until then, we had an ice man, Mr. Curry, and he lived on Forest Street. So we had to let him go. I was asked by Gordon to talk about farming in North Reading, but actually my family came to town at the end of the farming era. North Reading had always been a town of independent, self-sufficient people, and the Depression and during World War II, all the veterans came back and they kept that attitude going. That's why there were so many farms and shoe shops and carriage shops and sawmills because all the people in North Reading were trying to make a living and just that's the attitude that everybody had and that's what actually appealed to my parents. My father in his own way was a practical minded mechanical genius. No job was too big or too hot. <laughs> it didn't matter. He was still, always had a couple of irons in the fire was always moving. He dismantled machinery from the mills in Wakefield, Lawrence, scrapped the street, streetcar tracks out of Wakefield Center when they took the streetcars out of Wakefield Center and junked them at some foundry in Norwood. But during his time here, he had, he had a great friendship with the Eisenhower brothers, who had a farm on Haverhill Street, and they grew hothouse tomatoes and only sold them to the restaurants and hotels in Boston. All five brothers, there were five of them, they, they had houses on the farm. So, uh, where am I? The, and the farm had a coal-fired steam boiler system to heat, the, there were three or four big greenhouses, mm. 60, 70, 100 feet long. Mm. During World War II, they started burning battery boxes, which were a coal tar battery box that were like a half an inch thick, and it was all the car and truck batteries. They'd, when they died, they'd go to Chelsea to the junkyard. The junkyard would break the box open, dump the acid on the ground, 
take out the lid and throw the box away. So they would take the boxes, truck them up here, and fire them in the boiler like coal. And they burned. Unbelievable. But they smoked. <laughs> they were a lot of pollution. <laughs> but nobody seemed to really mind. <laughs> they got an award from the government for, for uh, using an alternative uh, source of fuel by not burning the coal during World War II. And they were like geniuses too. One of the brothers converted some potato digger, one of those conveyor chain potato digger things, into a sluice that he would separate the lead oxide out of what was left in the battery boxes. Wow. And apparently they could sell a barrel full of lead oxide for 200 bucks. It was like genius. But it was another way. Everybody just kept, that's what North Reading did. We didn't, we just ground it out. In the 50s, they bought a closed greenhouse operation in Melrose <coughs> to add to their complex up here in Havel Street. So my father, dismantled and removed the old boilers, the tanks, hundreds of feet of steam pipe, and brought it up here. In the process, their entire system was converted to oil. Because before that, they would have to stay up all night and keep that thing running 24-7 in the winter. So, there were two 20-foot by 9-foot boilers, steam boilers, my father moved them up here, retooled them, retooled them with a 12-year-old helper, me, in the back of the boiler. My job was to hold this thing in there, keep the tool from spinning. He was on the other end with a sort of a rotary tool that he would pound the sledgehammer and then pain the end of the tube over so it wouldn't leak could imagine how loud it was. I'm in the back of the boiler. Anyway, nowadays, social services would have uh, ended that operation. I wouldn't have let that go on, I hope. <laughs> Another thing he did, around this time, my father was junking cars. He was doing everything. And he got a uh, bonded transport bank truck from some bank in Lynn that he was supposed to junk. And he gave it to the Eisenhowers, and they used to haul tomatoes to Boston in it. And it had like four inch cork walls and two inch bulletproof glass in the windows, and they'd haul the tomatoes like it was a hot. They were just the right. Anyway, so he, uh, when the truck finally crapped out after a few years, he got it back and junked it. Another operation he had was uh, the Ewley Chicken Farm. That was a big one that was at the corner of North and Central Street. And when that closed down, where they built all the houses now, they had, I don't know, three or four three-story giant chicken coops. And my father got, I don't know how he did it, but anyway, he cut them into sections, made them like prefab garages, would take a whole wall sections and put them all together, and he assembled them all over the place. There's still some in Reading and North Reading, where he made these garages. They were like prefab, but it's just like he would do anything to make a buck. I think he had three jobs the whole time I ever knew him. He was just like, of course, he kind of burnt out when he was like 55. He was not. <laughs> I won't go there. <laughs> During World War II, North Reading had like a dozen chicken farms and truck farms. And, but after the war, the town started transitioning into a bedroom community. The old Yankees slowed down, sold out to make room for the new houses. I still live in the same house. It's still a dirt road. There's still no town water or street lights. But last year, a house on my road sold for a million bucks. <laughs> a million bucks. And now, it's cool to raise chickens in the backyard behind your million dollar home. <laughs> I don't get it. But I should have kept the old lady's chicken coop. <laughs> anyway, that's about my tale. Um, 
the town has changed just unbelievably. But uh, it's still the same town, kind of. It's still nice. Everybody's still nice. During the pandemic, like, they called me up to see, because I'm an old guy now, and they called me up to make sure I was okay and asked me if I need anything. And I don't know. It's still cool. So that's about it. No 10 minutes wouldn't, but... <laughs> Spencer, if you would come up. Mike, Mike to the mouth. Oh, uh, no, yep. thank you. Okay. Oh, that was great, John. Yeah. Hey, John. Are we going to come over here? Yeah. <laughs> you want to show it Thank you. Uh, it's Spicer. <laughs> Don't worry, that's been happening for a long time. Uh, so I am Noah Spicer, uh, and I hope that, uh, well, I have to say that I'm not going to be able to give any first-hand knowledge of the history of this town, unfortunately, and I'm happy to hear, and I would love to hear from as many of uh, the people in this room as I can, their personal memories of the history of this town, and I'll explain why. Uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the Spicer family who lived here in town and the farm and the property that they owned. Uh, and to start with that, uh, I do have some pictures up here, but you obviously can't see them from where you're sitting, but you'll be welcome to come up and take a look at them later on. So, the Spicer family house that some of you may know is 219 Park Street, and it is the blue house at the corner of Park Street and Central Street. It wasn't always blue, and it didn't always look like that, uh, and it wasn't the Spicer house for a very long time, but the Spicer family here in town uh, began towards the end of the 19th century when in 1890 uh, Charles Enos Spicer and his wife Amanda Spicer immigrated here from Parsboro, Nova Scotia. And I spent a lot of time the last couple weeks looking in old town records and archives trying to find out as much information about the Spicer family as I could and when it really started here. And they immigrated here in 1890 and Enos got basic he went by Enos it's a almost a Spicer family tradition that the men in the Spicer family went by their middle names instead of their first names so Charles Enos went by Enos his entire life and he started here in North Reading doing anything he could uh, to make money and excuse me yes Somebody's coat is ringing over there. <laughs> no, I don't mean to interrupt. It's, it's annoying. <laughs> well, it's just a soundtrack. <laughs> That's right. I'll uh, I'll try to talk over it. But um, but Charles Enos worked as a road worker for a long time here in town. It was still expanding, and they were paving roads and uh, the town records show that he was paid more than almost any other uh, town employee at that time. And eventually he came into the employ of Jared B. McLean, who many of you might know the Jared B. McLean house is the house right across the street there. Mr. McLean, who also immigrated here from Nova Scotia, and I think maybe that's why he took a liking to Enos, uh, he was a major producer of carriages here in town. He was a well-respected and well-known town businessman, and for somewhere in between 20, yeah, about 20 to 30 years, Enos worked for him as a carriage driver. He would take out the carriages, whether to test them or to bring them to their purchasers, and he really worked his way into a good relationship with Jared McLean. By that time, the Spicer family was living in a small house 
at the corner of Willow Street and Elm Street. Uh, right now I believe it belongs to the Shields Thomas family and I'm not certain whether it's the same house but I do know that that property was the original Spicer property here in town. Uh, after some time, Mr. McLean died in 1917, and when he died, he left a small portion of his wealth to uh, Charles Spicer, Enos Spicer, who used that money to purchase what was the old, um, I believe it was built by the Upton family, 219 Park Street, and at the time was owned by believe the widow of Peter G. Flint. Uh, and by the way, if I'm wrong in any of this, please correct me. Please tell me later on, and I'm happy to learn more. But that Spicer, that property was bought, and it became Meadowview Farm and Meadowview Dairy. There was a large barn up in the hill behind the house. The area out behind it now that's very swampy, was a pond, and as part of uh, as part of what he inherited from Jared McLean, Enos Spicer also received a beautiful black stallion named Charlie, and it was uh, according to Leo Murphy, who was a town historian back in the 50s and 60s, Charlie the horse was the most famous resident of North Reading. He was known for carrying the uh, or leading the parade at the Armistice Day Parade and the Veterans Day Parades and the Memorial Day Parades. And after McLean's death, the horse became Enos Spicer's. And along with about a dozen cattle, a few sheep, and a few of those uh, chickens in their big chicken coops, though not as big as two or three stories, I don't think, uh, Charlie the horse lived at Meadowview Farm uh, and was property of the Spicer family, and uh, children who would come along Park Street would stop and feed Charlie the horse apples and sugar cubes, <laughs> and eventually he became too old to pull carriages, and actually there is a picture here of Enos Spicer uh, with uh, his grandchildren being pulled by Charlie the horse before he was put out to pasture, and uh, late in the 1930s, Charlie the horse became uh, old and sick, and one day was found stuck in the mud on a hot summer day. He got stuck in the mud, and they couldn't get him out. So Charles Enos called up his son, Ralph Spicer, called up his son-in-law, Harold Conran, who was married to uh, Enos Spicer, who was mentioned earlier tonight, uh, Enos Spicer's what Enos Spicer's daughter was Florence Conran, Flossie. Oh. And so there's that connection there. And so Flossie called around, called up uh, her husband, called up her brother, and the whole fire department came down to pull Charlie the horse out of the mud. And finally, right before midnight, they got Charlie out, uh, and he seemed all right. But the next morning, uh, he couldn't stand up from his stable and Enos decided it was time to, to put Charlie down, who, by the way, lived 32 years. And the, that was, the uh, at the time, the death of the town's most famous resident. And a lot, of, uh, a lot of children were known to leave apples and sugar cubes on the farm property, even after Charlie died, in memory of him. And that was a, uh, that was a happy story. Well, didn't end so happy, but that was a story. And one of the things that the Spicer family was most famous for uh, was their ice cream stand, which was right across uh, Park Street. Before the street was widened so much that it's right at the edge of the swamp now, they had Meadowview Dairy. And to be honest, I didn't know much of this dairy until I started read or this ice cream stand, until I started reading about uh, Virginia McNeil Slep's memories of it that she puts in the transcript from time to time. And I looked into it and I asked my, my grandfather and my great uncles, and they do have memories of making the ice cream on the hot summer days directly from the cows on the farm. 
they'd make the milk, or they'd get the milk, they'd make the ice cream, and they sold root beer flavored and banana flavored ice cream, which was very rare for that time. And so for a time there was a good thing going, and the Spicers ran their dairy at Meadowview Farms and were well involved in the fire department. Someone mentioned that before Harold Conran, there was not a fire chief in town, and that's true. And that's true, uh, but there were fire wardens, and until about the 1930s, over half of the town's fire wardens were Spicers. They were either Ena Spicer, or his son Lester, or his, or his son-in-law Harold, or his son Ralph, and, uh, and they were very involved in the fire department. And eventually Enos got a bit old and handed off the farm to his son Ralph. Ralph ran the farm and was also a volunteer fire department captain until 1951 while, and this is where the history gets a bit murky for me, either he was fighting a brush fire or was burning brush, but Harold, uh, but um, Ralph's hand was infected by a thorn from one of the uh, brushes. He was burning and fighting, and he, it was infected in July of 1951. Ralph died of that infection, and it was around that time that fortune went downhill, and the Spicer farm uh, was not doing so well. They weren't able to produce the ice cream in the summers anymore, and uh, Enos died not long after that, and to save the family and to save their finances, Dorothy Spicer, who is the widow of Ralph, decided to sell the property to a Mrs. Murphy. Some of you might remember Mrs. Murphy. She was one of the first people in this town um, and a pioneering uh, woman at that to start um, developing properties and selling them in lots. And uh, I do not know Mrs. Murphy's name. I knew Mrs. Murphy's son, Bill, and I asked Bill what, he, what Mrs. Murphy's name was. He said, oh, that's Mrs. Murphy. <laughs> I said, didn't you call her mom or anything? Said, oh, I called her Mrs. Murphy. And, uh, and so that property eventually did become developed, and uh, the Spicer family uh, still lived in town for a long period after that, and they also owned property up on Swan Pond, where they would go, and that would be their summer vacation. They'd travel up to the pond, where actually uh, my grandmother, uh, who was from Everett, she would come up, and her grandparents owned property up on Swan Pond, and she would come and go swimming, and every once in a while, these rowdy, rowdy, crazy boys would come, and they'd go swimming, and they were always told to stay away from those boys. So you can imagine her parents and her grandparents' disappointment when 15 years later she married one of those crazy Spicer boys. Uh, and I don't want to end this, uh, end this story on too sad a note because uh, I was raised on these stories and I didn't think they were too sad even though they are filled with lots of young deaths and shooting horses and farms being sold. But I think the happy thing that can be taken out of this is that the Spicer family is still living in North Reading and still living around North Reading. And I will be honest, a lot of our history has been lost. I did not know much of this about the farm before, uh, before going on and learning after Gordon invited me, which is why I really appreciate people like Gordon and people like Lyman Fancy and Virginia McNeil Slep, who have been able to tell me and my father and my uncles and my aunt so much about our family that we never even knew because uh, so much of it was gone even when my grandfather and his siblings were young. Uh, so afterwards, please feel free to come and take a look at uh, some of the pictures we have of the old farm here. The first a uh, school bus in town was driven by Ralph Spicer, and we've got it right here. Uh, so, um, like I said, 
feel free, and I'll hand it off back to Gordon now. Used to deliver milk to us during the war down yeah. 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 Elm Street, and uh, so I'm glad to hear more more about the Spicer family. That was wonderful. Now uh, my son Mark is going to speak. I think he's going to talk about the Upton property. Let's see what he has to say. That's a tough act to follow. Yeah. I don't have the. Um, I don't know the English language as well as that young man, but we'll get through it. So I want to talk about the Uptons. Uh, I live in an Upton house. I was, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I was moved there from Elm Street, Upper Elm Street, in a little ranch in 1967, in December 1967, might as well be 1968. And um, it was an old house. It is an old house, and it was just in poor shape. The house was in poor shape, and uh, in fact, uh, we had a modern ranch built in 1957 and went up to a house built in 1702, and it was noisy and uh, uh, cold in the sun, in the winter, and I, I remember um, putting my Dixie cup full of water on the windowsill and woke up and it was frozen in the morning. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, seriously, that's how cold it was. The windows were just one pane glass, and the heating system was terrible. But it's turned into the love of my life, and it's the Upton's uh, main house, I think. I know it's the, um, it was built in 1702 by Francis Nurse. I'll bring you back from the beginning. And Pat, correct me if I'm wrong on any of this stuff. <laughs> um, but it's become the love of my life. It was instantly, actually, when I was eight years old, that I knew this was going to be the place I'd live for the rest of my life. And uh, like I say, it was in very tough shape. We've been working on it ever since, every day of the week, doing something. Every day, you got to do something to improve it, fix it, maintain it, and stay ahead of things. Uh, the Elkins bought it from uh, Joseph Fry in 1751. And they, uh, no, no, 1763, Fry bought it in 51. So um, Amos Upton bought it, and um, that's when the Uptons took over the property from 1702, which was the nurses, and anyone um, that studied the history at the Bachelor School or wherever, knows that Rebecca Nurse was one of the first Salem witches to be executed. Her son Francis built the house. Everybody agree with that? Mm -hmm. okay. um, so anyway, it became um, quite a place, I guess. Uh, Amos Upton, I mean, Lanson Upton, in later years, they, they owned Upton Lumber Company, which is where a lot of the Spencers work, which is now Monaghan Lumber, and I have aprons that say Upton Lumber on them. I have a sign up here that says, uh, no shooting Upton Lumber. And I've got Upton Avenue sign that's weathered to, uh, to, to beat the band anyway. Cedar Street was also Upton Road. No, it was, yeah, what was it called, Dave? Upton Street. Upton Street. And eventually in the 40s they changed it to, up to Cedar Street because it was confusing to have Upton Ave and Upton Street. Anyway, um, one of the same Cheetah Street and Upton Ave, if you ask me. But, um, so, over the years, Lanson and Henry Upton, the, the latter two, uh, Harold owned it uh, and sold it to Sweezy Lumber in the, after 1960, I think, because Harold died in 60. His wife Blanche sold it in 61. I think Sweezy Lumber bought it. Then, and uh, let me see if I get that right. 
whatever. What did go from Upton to Monaghan, there was a Sweezy in between. And uh, Mike Monaghan has an apron that says Sweezy Lumber on it. It's kind of cool. Um, but the Uptons were a big family in town. They, 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 one of them, Amos uh, Senior, said that uh, he made a rule you couldn't sell, if you're going to move out, you can't sell your house to anybody but another Upton so that it keeps the family close to home. And it worked. Everybody, all but one Charles Upton moved to Illinois and became a banker or something. But um, what a place. I wish I lived there at that time sometimes. You know, uh, Lance and Upton was 81. He was still hauling logs out of the woods. Uh, Leslie Upton, which was Louie, um, our good friend uh, Donald Upton, who's not here tonight, calls him Uncle Louie or Grandpa Louie. And uh, I don't know if you guys remember any of the Uptons or not, Dave and Dick. Oh, yeah. But uh, he loved Louie and uh, he was a hell of a teamster, I guess. He, he could handle, he had the 17 pair of horses in the long barn. <laughs> and I asked Donald just yesterday, I said, uh, did they have uh, much for uh, milk milkers there? And he said, no, surprisingly, they really didn't. They had a bowl, which no one went near, like any other farm in there, but they, they had a butcher shop down uh, across from what was Monroe's Railroad right. Ave, butcher shop, grocery store, Arthur up and sold it to his uh, nephew in, I forget, 1902, in 1905, different different sales. But they were in everything, ice, they, uh, they had an ice house, a gigantic ice house on Martin's Pond for years. And Louis Upton ran that, and uh, he sold it right before Westinghouse came up with the freeze of the, the uh, mechanical uh, yeah refrigerators and freezers and stuff like that. So two years before, I guess he was pretty shrewd. But two years before uh, they came out, he sold the ice business. There's also another small ice house on the history of Park Pond for the lo for the local neighborhood which was basically all Upton. So there's four houses on Upton Avenue, and uh, there was no reason to go up there unless you were Upton or working for them. Um, but, um, so I, I kind of feel privileged that I'm, I'm glad. When I work up there each day, I don't go to work anywhere else, but any spare moment or, you know, I enjoy it, it's not a, it's not a burden at all. And I, I, the end result is it's beautiful up there now. When we got it, it was a little run down, and it's beautiful. Uh, Eddie Wheeler used to plant out in the field when we first got there, then Lyman Fancy took over, and Lyman did it for almost 25, 30 years? Probably 30 years, yeah. Sorry he couldn't be with us tonight, he's uh, busy. But. Um, Anyway, that's my story, my view about the Uptons. They were well-respected people, I, I understand. Selectmen, fire chiefs, a lot of them were selectmen and fire chiefs, and uh, uh, there's so many of them I could go against them, you know. David and Dick, do you have any re recollection no, of any of the Uptons? Well. Do you remember Henry? Or just Harold. I remember Harold, Louis, Edgar. Uh, Edgar, I, I work for Edgar. Robert, yeah. Robert Upton, Bobby, Bobby. my age. Yeah, yeah, that's Donald's Edgar. brother. Yeah. And I, Donald's yeah. brother. There's, there's the house at Havel at Chester Street up on the hill. Was There was a beautiful old Upton house there. Yeah, Lanson lived in my house. Yeah. And then he, he only lived there 13 years moved over there, there was a tavern. Yeah, it was burned and down, and I don't know when, but it's... Burned down in 1916. Yeah. His son, um, Walter, yeah. Walter lived with him until he died, and then a few ladies, years later, it burned down. But I guess it was a beautiful place. And across from that house was um, a, a road, which is running around 112 Central Street. Chestnut Street, they went right straight to the power line, which was uh, Cedar Swamp. Mm -hmm. And Lanson is a picture in my book of him collecting uh, Cedar posts mm -hmm. when he was 81 years old in the winter. 
<laughs> yeah, so they were rugged guys, rugged people and stuff. And I didn't mention the woman that they were married to, but... Uh, they must have been tough, too. <laughs> so, does anybody have any questions or answers? Very good. If I don't, if I don't get anything wrong, I'll just simply say I'll circle back on that. <laughs> Great job, Master. All right. To, uh, to talk a little bit about a new project that's, that's going on. As you know, the Minutemen have, uh, have, have built a uh, farm museum a few years ago and have lots of the uh, farm equipment that uh, has been used in uh, threading and so forth. Uh, uh, as you know, we had the uh, Eisenhower John Deere tractor, the 1937 John Deere tractor, and Mr. Raymond Turner's uh, Woods and tractor and numerous other things that are all we try to we try to collect things that are just from North Ready. And there's a new project that's uh, in the works now. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, we learned about a, a windmill that was up on the Van Latham property. And the Van Latham property was at the intersection of Park and Winter Street, and and it, and it set way back off the road. As a matter of fact, the driveway was very long. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, some of my sons told, told me about this windmill, said I had to see it. Well, we went to look at it and it was really very rustic. Uh, it was mounted on wooden posts and uh, it had been there for a long time. And uh, when the developers came in from Boston, I went over to see the superintendent and I said, uh, you want that windmill? He said, what's a windmill? <laughs> so I took him over and, and we looked at it and he said, no, if you think you need that, you better take it. <laughs> so we did. And so we thought we needed it and we were gonna, we were gonna stand it up, but we, we never did. It's been laying around all this time. Well, Bob Snyder was over to our property a while ago and uh, you all know Bob Snyder. He, he just put up that telephone pole, the, uh, tele the, uh, the flagpole uh, that was on the common for 123 years, and, and it fell over in uh, 2010, one night, thank goodness, no one got hurt. <laughs> but he refurbished that, and what, uh, you, uh, what a job, when you see it, if you haven't seen it, you won't believe the job he's done on it. Mm -hmm. So he saw this windmill, he said, what are you gonna do with that? I said, we'll probably take it to Chelsea, the junk guy. He said, no, why don't we, why don't, uh, why don't we restore it? But George and I will restore it. Well, George is George Kane, his friend George Kane. And by the way, they're members of the Minutemen now, they join, but they're never gonna carry muskets. Uh, and they're never gonna be marching, they just wanna do special projects. So they're in the process now of rebuild the, you know, Bob did some research on this windmill and it looks like it was built about 1905 or 1908. And uh, so what our hope is, and uh, of course we have to get it past a certain board here in town, but I know some of the people will see what happens. Um, we'd like to take and mount it at the, at the west end of the farm museum. I, and, uh, and, and, and it'll look, it'll look like it's original, it originally was. It'll have wooden supports and, and uh, the whole business. So uh, I think it's gonna be a nice project. And, and uh, I can tell you right now, Bob and George can do anything. <laughs> so I think that, uh, I think it'll, it'll go very well there. And you'll be able to see it, if you drive by the Putnam House, you'll be able to see it very nicely. And of course, there's no well there or anything like that, but still it'll give people the principle of uh, how a windmill works. But there, so. there is a well 
Well, the well, the, the, the well is way down back. I know. Right? But we, we, uh, this here is just, yeah. this is just going to be for looks. We'll, we'll have a pump. We can find a way to pump some water, but just for the principle of the thing. But I yes. Re I remember when that was operating down at Van Wakeham's. Oh, you do? Yeah. Really? Wow. Oh. <laughs> She's old. <laughs> <laughs> no. So anyway, I think I think it, I think it's going to be a nice fit there behind the button house. Yes. Yeah. And um, what I'm in hopes, Jenny, is that you're going to be able to find a name for that little village sometime. We keep saying the buildings behind the Putnam House. But, but well, we call it the Putnam House grounds, we but we call it the Putnam property. It is a Putnam property, absolutely. But I was wondering if we could. Anyway, yeah. I think I think it'd be nice if you could put a name to it sometime. Yeah. So, does uh, anyone have any questions for? No. <laughs> Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the evening. Yeah, we're we're really Job as always. Thank you for the show. Yeah, yeah. Refreshments there. It got pictures, photographs, um, various new dads. So come on up, have a look. And thank you all for coming.